All right, thank you very much. Um, so my focus today is is mostly on you know basic principles of of ART. Um, of course, there's there's quite a few aspects of of HIV care. This is mostly focused on um, initiation monitoring of uh, of ART. Um, so just um, just to jump into the um, some of the virology behind the the different categories. Um, so usually we start. Um, of course, there's the entry inhibitors, which are the first class, um, where uh, there's a GP120 and GP41 subunits um, that combine, and then those interact uh, with the CD4 and CCR5 receptor um, on the host uh, CD4 T cells. Um, and so those medications are less, less clinically um, significant for most patients, um, but important in, in resistance. Um, Resistant infections. Um, moving down, of course, as the uh, the virus integrates into the host genome, um, the reverse transcriptase inhibitors are are really the foundation of um, of most HIV therapy. Um, these are um, a few of our most commonly used ones. Um, so there's nucleoside um, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and then non-nucleoside, um, sometimes called nukes and non-nukes. Um, that both um, act, uh, that both target this enzyme. Um, let me also have the the integrase um, inhibitors involved with the integration um, into the host host genome. Um, um, the, and then, of course, finally, what's involved with uh, cleaving and processing. Um, and the new viral particles are the the protease inhibitors, which are typically boosted um, with ritonavir or cobacystat. Um, so I, I think it would, I thought it would be um, both interesting and, and a little more memorable to talk about some of the his, just a little bit of the history of of um, the antiviral medications and, and kind of why our guidelines are um, are what they are today. Um, so just starting off, 1981 um, when AIDS was initially described clinically, um, and then 1983 isolated. Um, Fairly soon, fairly soon after that, in 1985, there were clinical trials for the first NRTIs, the first being um, azidothiamidine or um, zidovudine, a um, thymidine analog, um, which was actually approved for, for use in 1987. Um, shortly there afterwards. So that zidovudine, it was actually um, a drug that had already been around for a while at the time. Um, it was developed in 1960 as an anti-cancer drug um, that was withdrawn due to lack of efficacy. Um, later explored as an antibiotic too. Um, it was associated with improved survival at, at 24 weeks, although the survival de benefits diminished um, with time. Um, had quite a bit of toxicities, neutropenias, anemia, myositis, nausea, vomiting. Um, here's, a, here's a couple comparisons that I, I, um, I thought were interesting. This, this paper here on the left, um, it's given to me from, from Dr. Tony, one of the original, um, the original paper that showed um, kind of the, the efficacy of, of um, zidothiamidine at the time, um, looking at um, the number of serious events um, out to 24 weeks um, was significantly reduced with zidothiamidine versus placebo. Um, of course, you know, more, more time, more data, um, Going into the 1990s, the second chart is a table from 1994, um, kind of showing the relative rate of mortality among patients treated with with um, zidovudine. Um, and they did kind of looking at the relative um, rate of mortality. It was quite a, it was decreased um, at 24 months. Um, kind of beyond that, though, um, there's actually a, a slight increase in mortality um, farther out in time. Um, so. Quite a few reasons that, you know, presumably part of that reason is, is the the, um, the toxicities associated with the medication. Um, subsequent NRTIs um, came out fairly soon. Um, Delcidabine, didanazine, and stavudine. Um, all of these came with uh, their own significant toxicities. Um, there were um, delcidabine. Um, for instance, had up to a 33% chance of peripheral neuropathy, 
Um, the others had black box warnings for pancreatitis, um, lactic acidosis, severe hepatotoxicity. Um, and it, it was, um, you know, the attempts to alleviate this included sequential alternating therapy, none of which were very effective. Um, it was largely believed at the time that, uh, that zidobudine would be re replaced pretty quickly with something more effective, but it turned out to be um, several years before that, that really happened. Um, lamivudine eventually came out, um, so in 1995, uh, which was a major step forward. This was much more tolerable for most patients. Um, it was interesting, monotherapy was associated with rapid resistance, but it was very synergistic with the others um, at the time. Um, of course, an important point, none of the dual NRT uh, regimens alone could reliably control the viral load um, until the advent of triple therapy. Um, so it was improved, but still not suppressive uh, at the time. An important development from this was that uh, HIV-infected pregnant women um, could substantially decrease transmission to the newborn too, using these regimens. Um, shortly after, um, after that, um, protease inhibitors started to, to become more popular. Um, uh, sequinavir, the first protease inhibitor, was approved. And denivir was also approved, which was one of the, the medications really credited with, with starting the um, highly active antiretroviral area. Um, there's a small study that um, showed a combination of zidobudine, lamivudine, and denivir sustained HIV viral suppression um, throughout the study and beyond, which was really the, one of the first times that the triple therapy um, had come into use. But denivir was, was hard to take. It, it required uh, three times a day dosing without food, was associated with frequent nephrolithiasis, um, and hyperlipidemia uh, remains a, a class effect for the protease inhibitors. Um, uh, among the NNRTIs, nivirapine um, was the first one approved in 1996, um, which, uh, you know, similar to lamivudine, it, it developed resistance quickly when administered alone um, or as an add-on, but was effective with the three-drug regimen. Um, there was one study called the, the INCA study, um, showed was triple therapy uh, was completely suppressive and superior to a to a dual nucleoside regimen. Um, um, in 1996, um, you can see that the mid-90s were, were a very busy time for uh, the development of, of ART. Um, this is when the first set of guidelines were released um, by the International Antiviral Society. Um, they recommended therapy based on um, you know, CD4, plasma, um, RNA levels and patients' clinical status, and typically treatment was reserved for, for fairly advanced disease um, at the time, and a lot of this was driven by, I think, um, toxicities and also limited experience. Um, the protease inhibitors were only recommended in more, more advanced disease. Um, but um, important, important concept, though, this was um, leading cause of death among young persons at the time, um, but these therapies made it um, for the first time start to feel like a chronically manageable disease. Um, coming after that, what's, what uh, is, is also arguably the most important um, class today, um, the integrase inhibitors. Uh, Raltegravir was the first one, um, approved in 2007, also called as interest. Um, Highly potent, well tolerated, um, and it, um, these medications quickly became integrated as uh, first line regimens um, for ART. Um, Albutegravir and dolutegravir shortly followed. Um, Mictegravir, uh, which we all know is part of Mictarvi, um, is the most recent one in, in uh, clinical use. It's improved uh, just in 2018. Um, um, so again, just a summary of the ones in use. Um, so elbotegravir is one that is to, uh, boosted with cobacistat. Um, and the interesting one that I'll um, talk a little bit more about later, cabotegravir, is a potential long-acting injectable um, that's uh, in clinical trials um, at this time, not, not in clinical use. Um, 
side effects of these are, are a weight gain from an unknown mechanism, um, uh, typically more so than the, than the protease inhibitors. Um, although they're, they're more lipid, they are fairly lipid neutral. Uh, insomnia and dizziness are, are uh, less common side effects as well. Um, so just to, just to take a break from the pharmacology a little bit, um, we've all heard about um, you know, Ryan White um, and Ryan White funding. Um, so I just thought I'd take a minute to talk about who he was and um, how it affects you know the the care and the um, the care that we provide today. So he was a, a boy who was diagnosed with with AIDS at age 13 in um, uh, December 1984. Um, he had hemophilia and he had uh, he had acquired it from a factor concentrate preparation um, at the time, and he. When he was diagnosed, he faced significant discrimination um, in going back to school. Uh, I think it was, you know, the disease was misunderstood. No one know, you know, they were concerned about whether they would you know, contract it from just from being in the same room. Um, of course, there was just a lot of misconception at that time. Um, he eventually died from it um, in, in 1990, but you know, because of his story, he quickly became a, a poster child for, for HIV. And, um, um, his story kind of is the namesake for the for the Ryan White Comprehensive um, AIDS Resources Emergency Act that was signed into law um, the same year that he passed. So, so he's this is how he still influences our our care now. Um, so, of course, we we kind of discussed delaying treatment. Um, you know, today uh, we we typically start treatments um, immediately. Um, but of course, this this was uh, not an overnight um, change. There were several studies that that kind of slowly changed the um, the practice that we that we have today. Um, one of them was the Accord trial. It followed more than seventeen thousand patients, um, and see so those who had CD4 count three hundred and fifty one to five hundred who deferred ART until it had climbed below that. Um, had a 69% increased risk of death compared to those who did not. Um, and another one was STAR trial in 2015. Um, it followed 4,600 patients uh, for an average of three years. Um, initiation of ART in uh, HIV positive adults with CD4 greater than 500 provided net benefits over deferring therapy. Um, there, Primary endpoints um, was spelled out there: death from any cause, um, several, um, several others: tuberculosis, Kaposi sarcoma. Um, I'll show you a graph on the next slide. Um, so, with deferred initiation, um, you can see just kind of a comparison: deferred initiation versus immediate, um, and just a significant reduction in in primary events. Um, with earlier initiation. Um, as far as when that when that made its way into guidelines, um, most of the guidelines have, have been updated to, to kind of reflect that within the past decade. Um, several sets of guidelines that are still used commonly, Department of Health and Humans, um, Human Services uh, in 2012, the World Health Organization in 2015, um, International Antiviral Society in, in 2014. Um, the ones that that um, we we uh, we use today, um, and that have been the basis for for most of the rest of my talk, are from the Department of Health and Human Study, um, Human Services, excuse me. Uh, that was updated in December 2019, uh, and then the International Antiviral Society USA guidelines updated in uh, October 2020. Um, so what this actually recommends um, consists of a backbone of two NRTIs and a base consisting of, a, of at least one drug um, among the four groups, um, base or anchor as it's, as it's commonly referred to. Um, so this can be integrase inhibitors, uh, which are typically um, the first choice, protease inhibitors, um, the uh, non-nukes um, or CCR5 antagonists. Um, which I will explain a little bit more. Um, but just to kind of help represent this a little more, more visually, um, this is kind of a way that's, that's helped me in, in referring to these medications and 
um, remembering the names and abbreviations. So if we, we focus on our on our backbone of uh, two NRTIs uh, as follows here. Um, of course, there are combinations. Um, Sorry, my computer seems to have locked up. OK, OK, there we go. Um, so yeah, looking at the combinations, we have um, Truvada, the SCOVI, um, Epsicom. Truvada uses the old formulation of, of tenofovir. Um, SCOVI uses the new, um, the newer formulation, uh, which we call TAF. Um, and then moving on to, so the integrase inhibitors, um, these are some of the combinations that, that we frequently use um, for integrase inhibitors. Um, of course, Bictarvi is commonly our first line, Triumac. Um, then one thing I, I just wanted to point out, um, something that's a more recent change um, is the, the option of, of dual drug regimens as, as monotherapy. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little, there's a lot of nuances to that. I'm going to talk about those um, a little bit more um, in the coming slides. But these, these uh, the two that we currently use are um, dolutegravir containing regimens. Um, moving on to, to the others. Uh, so the in NRTIs, um, which we typically use a little bit less today, uh, Odevsi, Complera, Atripla, based on Efavirenz, which has quite a few side effects. Um, from um, abnormal dreams was, was a common one um, used less commonly today. Some psychiatric side effects. Um, the the ones highlighted in red are have a caloric requirement, so typically need them with food um, for for adequate absorption. It's, it's primarily the protease inhibitors um, and also repivirine um, from the NNRTI class. Um, these are the protease inhibitors are also typically boosted with CYP3A4 inhibitor, um, cobacistat and, and ritonavir. Um, a couple another just quick point I wanted to make the some of these are not recommended if the viral load is high at the initiation of therapy, um, especially with primarily with repivirine and then combination of bacavir and and lamivudine. Um, and then, of course, in the asterisks are all the single tablet regimens um, that we, not a comprehensive list, but ones that we, we commonly use. Um, so digging a little bit more into what the true first, first line therapies really are. Typically, um, without contraindications, integrase inhibitor and two NRTIs. Um, ones that we commonly know of, Bictarvi, um, which uses Bictagravir recently approved. Um, Triumac, um, as well as um, these are these are separate medications in this case, it's dual tablet regimens. Um, the SCOVI, Stivica, um, using Dolutegravir, and then similarly with with Raltegravir or Isentris. Um, there are of course the the TDF equivalents um, of these last two as well, uh, which. Use use Truvada instead of Discovery. Um, an interesting um, option recently of uh, two drug regimens being um, an option as a first first line, although um, certainly not common practice at this point. Um, but the combination dolutegravir um has been shown to be non inferior to the combination of dolutegravir plus um, a formulation of tenofovir with FTC. Um, there's there's some nuances to this. Your your pretreatment um, viral RNA can't be above 500,000. Um, those who have HPV co-infection um, or will initiate results before you get your genotype test should should not be started on this as as a first line. And of course, typically because we want to start treatment in it immediately, um, this um, of course this is restricted for, for using this medication, which tends, tends to be why we use the other classes much more. Um, baseline testing. Um, so when a, a patient is getting ready to, to start treatment, uh, this is some of the baseline um, tests that are needed. Um, of course, you need HIV testing, your genotype 
testing or CD4 plus, um, viral load, um, CBC with diff, chemistry, UA, your serology for, for hepatitis to fasting glucose and lipids. Um, Utility B5701 is for um, if considering a bacavir, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about that too. Um, tropism, if considering a, a CCR5 antagonist or Maraviroc. Of course, uh, pregnancy tests for women of, of childbearing childbearing age. Um, so bacavir hypersensitivity and typically presents around seven to eight days after treatment. Um, can occur as early as one to two days. Um, or, or several weeks into treatment too. Um, typically presents with fever, constitutional symptoms, and, uh, and GI disturbances. Um, about one third have respiratory symptoms as well. Um, of course, we use the HLA B5701 allele as, as our screening tool. Um, so we typically wait to get the results of that before starting treatment. Um, other, there are other alleles that are sometimes responsible, but they're much, much less frequently encountered. Um, let's see. So one thing to also consider in, in an initial regimen um, is if your initial viral load is, is above certain cutoffs. Um, so if it's above 100,000, um, I mentioned in the in the larger chart, all the real piverine based um, regimens are, are not recommended. Um, Altegravir plus um, Boosted darunavir, also bacavir, maybe dean, um, and then they're they're also not recommended if uh, um, these two primarily are not recommended CD4 less than 200. Um, and like I mentioned on the, the other slide, uh, value tegravir lamivudine combo is is not recommended about 500,000. Um, so for for monitoring. Um, Fairly soon after initiation, um, there's several labs we need to repeat viral load, um, basic chemistry, and LFTs uh, within two to eight weeks. Um, I know CD4 isn't uh, technically part of the guideline recommendation. A lot of times we, we do it clinically to, to keep um, close track of it, but um, it definitely is recommended um, in your in three to six month intervals. Um, you're also following the viral load. Um, your CBC, basic chemistry, and LFTs. Um, and then ear analysis typically can be done yearly. It's the recommendations for six months if they're on the old old formulation of tenofovir. Um, annual testing, CD4. Um, of course, and then the ones in, um, the ones in bold here of our data are the, the new ones for that time frame. Um, so, and then random fasting glucose lipids and, and a UA, if not done already. Um, from the guidelines that um, I want to show, I thought it was interesting. After um, a couple of years on ART, you're, sometimes you can follow your CD4 count um, less frequently um, or, even, or even not at all in some patients. Um, if it's between 300 and 500, can be followed every 12 months um, under the every 12 month category. Um, if your CD4 count is over 500 and your viral load is suppressed, um, technically from the from the guidelines, it's not it's it's an optional thing. Of course, we typically would do it um, just that just to keep an eye on the, the CD4 count. But um, I just wanted to share that um, the guidelines suggest it's optional. Um, and then here's just a continuation of that um, that chart as well. Uh, See your um, clinical response as far as um, monitoring your clinical response. Um, the virologic suppression is is the most important um, indicator. Uh, overall, poor um, poor CD4 recovery um, in patients is is associated with with older age at initiation. Uh, Pretreatment CD4 less than 200. Um, hepatitis C co-infection. Um, HIV-2 co-infection as well. Um, what's interesting, you typically see a couple of phases. Um, in three to six months, um, you get a rapid release of memory CD4 cells within lymphoid tissue. Um, and then, but over the, the coming years, you see a gradual increase um, in CD4 cells. 
Uh, we've already built a um, naive CD4 cells from thymus and, and uh, memory CD4 cells as well. Um, so kind of looking at that graphically, um, what that means, you can see um, kind of the early rise in, in CD4 um, in the weeks after starting. Um, ART that, that very slowly plateaus um, in that three to six year window. Um, you can see that that plateau um, tends to happen a bit sooner um, when you're high, when your CD4 count is higher to begin with. Um, it, it seems to be stretched out a bit more um, starting from a lower CD4, but you do still have that plateau um, effect that happens after a few years of therapy. So that was a very insightful um, depiction of the, the trend. Um, so about 15% of those with HIV and advanced immunosuppression will, will not have a recovery um, above 200. Um, although it's it's important to know that um, you know, failure to surpass that is not an indication to change a regimen, um, so long as your, your viral load is, is consistently suppressed um, over at least two years. Um, it's also important just to, to make sure there's no other medications that could be um, affecting your, your CD4 count, any bone marrow suppressive medications. Um, that should be considered too. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to hit on um, just a few common clinical scenarios um, that we run into and then you know, just, just basic ways that we, basic considerations we should have with uh, ART um, when we run into those. Um, so, of course, first pregnancy, um, for individuals trying um, to conceive the, the NRTI backbone um, at this point in time should, should not include TAF. It's, um, there's some ongoing studies um, uh, to include TAF in pregnancy, uh, and it's likely to be approved eventually, but it, it is not at this time. Um, the old formulation of tenofovir um, is instead preferred for that, um, either in combination with intracitabine, lamivudine, um, or the combination of bacavir, lamivudine. Um, then your anchor drug can consist of uh, raltegravir or um, one of these protease inhibitors that are boosted. Um, I've hi highlighted uh, um, trivata, well, tenofovir with intracitabine, which uh, commonly called trivata, and then raltegravir, commonly isentris. Um, that, that's uh, one of the more common, well-tolerated um, regimens that we often use in, in pregnancy. Um, an important point to note, cobacystat regimens um, may not have sufficient serum levels um, in pregnancy um, in the second and third trimesters. Um, so women can be on this, um, you know, who are, who are trying to conceive, it's a, it's a consideration for them, um, but then once if uh, if a woman becomes pregnant, though, then it's um, it's likely worth revisiting um, the regimen in, the, in that scenario. Um, so just a, a comment about dolutegravir um, and the integrase inhibitors in pregnancy. Um, there, there's kind of an interesting study, um, Botswana, um, that that initially suggested an increased risk of neural tube defects. Um, to infants born to women receiving thalutegravir at, at conception. Um, some updated analysis showed it to be less common than it was initially thought, um, but still higher than women who were receiving regimens that, that did not contain thalutegravir. Um, so 0.9 to 0.3% um, from a control group of 0.1%. Of this, this isn't a, a contraindication to, to dolutegravir at, at this point. Um, it's more of a counseling point um, for women who are, um, you know, would be considering this regimen if they're of childbearing potential. Um, and even though it's, it's not one of the, and the regimens listed on the last slide, it's an alternative um, rather than a preferred regimen. Um, in CKD, um, there's there's several important considerations here. Um, the the old formulation of tenofovir um, we typically use when GFR is is above 60, um, but the newer formulation it's it's well tolerated down to down to 30, um, 
in in dialysis patients. Um, many of the NRTIs can be can be taken after dialysis. Um, uh, there's TAF is still kind of being studied in in dialysis patients um, used in the Genvoya combination. It, it has been used safely um, on a daily basis um, and given after dialysis on those just on those dialysis days. Um, another point with um, Jaluka, which is the other um, dual therapy that, that can be considered as, as a a single tablet regimen, um, in addition to the to the Devado we talked about earlier, um, can be this can also be considered um, for for patients who have an undetectable viral load for, for at least six months. Um, of course, no history of resistance mutations with the components, ropivirine or dolutegravir, um, and they must be hepatitis B negative as well. Um, since we've referred to it a few times. Um, I just wanted to, to hit on the differences in the old and new formulation um, of tenofovir. TAF, which, which we use more commonly today, uh, has fewer bone renal toxicities, although the old formulation actually did have a better metabolic profile. Um, risk factors um, for that for the nephrotoxicity, which we're most concerned about, um, concurrent use of a, of a protease inhibitor, pre-existing CKD, um, low body weight or uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, renal function typically improves um, after nephrotoxicity, although it may not fully recover. Uh, this is uh, also tends to be studied with vitamin D deficiency. Um, like we've talked about, TAF not yet approved in pregnancy. Um, cardiac, cardiac risk factors are uh, important considerations. This is an important cause of mortality and Patients with HIV um, uh, who are at increased risk. So um, one smaller consideration, prolonged QTC, um, we typically avoid um, in RTIs, ropivirine, efavirenz in, in that situation. Um, abacavir is, um, is this is a debatable, debatable subject. There's a, there's a study in 2008 um, showed an increased risk of MI in those um, on abacavir Didanosine, which of course we don't use didanosine um, today, but um, so abacavir um, was used quite a bit less in, in the years after that study came out. Um, but there's um, there's been a meta analysis and some other reviews since that time showing showing some conflicting results. So that's still um, a very debatable um, topic, but a, a consideration to to remember. Um, so. Some co-infections that are important. Um, hepatitis B is one that one of the most common that we that we encounter. Um, in this regimen, patients who, who can be on a tenofovir regimen generally should um, with hepatitis B. Um, uh, often that's in combination with um, lamivudine or amtricitabine, uh, although those those can't be the only drugs um, in the regimen with hepatitis B activity. Um, and in the cases when tenofovir can't be given, um, entecavir is, is an alternative. Um, but uh, important to remember, entecavir without ART um, can, provokes, can provoke the uh, M184V mutation and, and confer resistance um, to the two other medications that, that do have some activity against hepatitis B. Um, other hepatitis B treatment regimens are are not typically recommended if you're if you're on ART for HIV. Um, for hepatitis C, um, all patients are with Hep C are still candidates for for curative Hep C treatment, um, but they should should remain on their ART for for HIV. Um, and this is based more so there, there's less. Um, um, it, it's more so based on possible interactions with uh, with selecting the, the ideal regimen. Um, of course, we want to ensure screening for hepatitis A and, and B um, at the same time. Um, tuberculosis, um, no issues if if uh, isoniazid is used alone um, in prolonged treatments uh, for latent TB. Um, one important um, 
consideration, rifampin uh, is, you know, which is typically our preferred rifamycin. Uh, it's a potent 3A4 inducer. Um, so you could think of it as having the opposite effect of, of a booster. Um, and it can reduce your concentration of the protease inhibitors by over 75%. Um, integrase inhibitor concentration are, are often reduced as well. Um, but that's not to say it can't be used altogether. It, uh, one example with raltegravir, you can double your dose to 100 milligrams BID from uh, normal dosing of 400. Um, rifibutin, uh, it tends to be much less of an inducer and uh, can be, is, you have much more flexibility um, with rifibutin. Uh, it's just important to keep uh, dose adjustments in mind with, with that medication as well. Um, so encountering encountering resistance and and what to do about it. Um, so the International Antiviral Society guidelines um, hit on this. Uh, if your viral load is uh, you can well, it's common to have a blip between 20 to 200 per mil, which can be due to adherence, um, but not always. It can be due to transient stressors, illness. Um, even with perfect adherence, you can have a viral blip. Um, but if you do have um, a viral load above 200, uh, based on their, their guidelines, uh, on two measurements, then it's worth considering a genotype. Um, one important consideration to, to successfully get a genotype, you often need a viral load um, greater than 400 um, to perform genotype, and just to have sufficient um, viral load to to perform the testing. Um, so that's important to keep in mind too. Common mutations um, may require discontinuing therapy um, and restarting with a different class. One of the most common um, that we encounter is, is the M184V. Um, it actually confers up to a thousand fold increased resistance to lamivudine and tricitabine. Um, but actually increases your susceptibility to um, tenofovir and zidovudine, um, which of course we use much much less um, in today's practice. Um, but uh, oftentimes this this mutation alone doesn't um, isn't by itself uh, typically require a change in therapy. Um, Bictardi and uh, Genvoya, for example, um, based on this alone, you can base your treatment decisions more on their viral load and CD4 count um, than making a change based on this alone. Um, other important ones, um, I-50 and 84V resistance all commonly use protease inhibitors. So if they do have that, you would want to consider um, alternate classes. Um, this mutation uh, it confers varinavir resistance, um, but is um, you, you retain your sensitivity to adazanavir, so you can still use this protease inhibitor. Um, so and then K103N parts uh, nevirapine and fabrin's resistance about 50-fold um, and 20-fold, respectively. Um, so those are just some of the more common ones. Um, what you can consider if, if uh, um, you know, just switching regimens is not likely to be sufficient or a patient has, has tried several and, and failed multiple classes um, of, of ART. Um, these are some of the inhibitors that you can consider for those patients. Baravaroc um, is the CCR5 antagonist. Um, um, it can be used with a dual NRT, NRTI background. backbone is sort of the, the anchor or the base um, of that regimen. Um, um, Abilizumab was approved in 2018. It, it's uh, IV infusion every two weeks for heavily um, treatment experienced patients with multi-drug resistant HIV. Um, and this is the uh, the monoclonal antibody. Uh, it's being used with with uh, some very good very good results right now. Um, Stemsevere more recently in July 2020 binds the GP120 um, subunit of the HIV virus. Um, to prevent um, to prevent entry, um, 
And then in Fervitide, uh, March 2003, this was actually the, the first fusion inhibitor, um, which is a biomimetic peptide. Um, it actually mimics some of the replication machinery of the of a HIV. Um, just some other smaller considerations for um, for choosing ART, um, or or if you have to change it later on in therapy. Uh, osteoporosis is one. Um, the old formulation of tenofovir um, should typically not be used in osteoporosis because it can, um, like we talked about earlier, the um, bone and renal toxicities are greater with old formulation as, composed, as opposed to TAF. Um, psychiatric illness, typically avoid efavirenz, fixed dose uh, regimens containing it. Um, Ropivirine is also one of the, and in RTIs is suspected to have some psychiatric effects. Um, so sporadic eating patterns too. Pat patients may or may not be taking their medication with food, um, so it makes sense to avoid treatments that have a caloric uh, requirement for absorption. Um, again, that includes ropivirine um, and protease inhibitors, um, commonly in, in those scenarios. Um, future direction of, of uh, ART. This is so the newest um, integrase inhibitor that I, I kind of hit on briefly that Cabotegravir is, is being studied now as a long-acting injectable. Um, it's very similar to um, it's a structural analog of uh, dolutegravir, um, and it has an extremely long half-life. Um, the oral formulation is 40 hours, and the injectable is 21 to 50 days. Um, there's some thinking that it, it could be started as an oral formulation just to, to ensure no side effects, good tolerability, that's then sort of transitioned into a long-acting injectable, um, which should have a lot of, um, quite a few benefits um, for, for patients who have um, any difficulty taking medication every day. Um, this can make a dramatic difference um, in care. And um, it's also being considered for, for both um, prevention too with, with PrEP. Um, so that's a that's a development that we can look forward to um, in the coming years. Um, so that's just kind of a that's a summary of some of the basic concepts and and starting ART. I, I just wanted to um, quickly thank uh, Dr. Morano, Dr. Tony Sherbuck, Castanius, and Simon Willie to help me out um, with this presentation. Um, so I appreciate your, your input, and uh, I've included my uh, references here. And um, thank you all for, for your attention. If I can answer any questions, please let me know.